All right, we've heard from a pantheon of thought leaders across the country in this interesting area. Our final speaker for today will be Dr. T. Colin Campbell. I don't know that I need to say more. I, I'll say as he's walking up, the author of The China Study, he's dedicated more than 60 years of his life to human health and diet, and The China Study is one of the most comprehensive studies of health and nutrition conducted. You all know him from Forks and Knives, Dr. Campbell. Well, thank you so much for all of you coming, and I particularly like, would like to thank the organizers, Naomi, Helen, uh, and, and her crew. Uh, this is really a fantastic you know, congregation, I think, of uh, plant-based eaters almost. I think most of you are. <laughs> I, I'm just curious, how many of you, uh, let's say, have heard one of us uh, speak at least once? No, let me ask the other way around. How many of you have not heard one of us speak once? Just get a feel for that, okay. Um, I, uh, I've been in this business for, this is my 63rd year professionally, uh, starting with my graduate work in food and health at the time, so I've, I've been around the block a little bit. Uh, I enjoyed the uh, being in science so much during the years, and in fact, I sit here now, even getting excited, uh, listen to people like Dr. Esselton and Dr. Lee. Uh, science is a very exciting thing. And I just want to share that with you because it turns out that as I sort of got in science and discovered I liked it so much and, and that sort of thing and had a lot of students work with me and postdocs and so forth, um, the thing about science that I really liked was the idea that we could actually ask questions that we had in mind and uh, work them out, get some answers, not always right, but that was the exciting part of it, because when it wasn't exactly right, we could sit around and talk about it, and we could debate it. And that's the nature of science. It's, you know, without having a lot of discord, and a very civil kind of discussion, sometimes uh, quite strongly worded, perhaps. But anyhow, science is what I have found as a fantastic career. And I say that because I actually started uh, in a territory that as many of you may know, that's quite different from what I talk about now. And so it was a bit of a struggle at times to go from what I once knew, or thought I knew, I should say, until I'm at this particular point. And as I look back over the career, in a, in a sense, uh, and watched had this kind of things I had to deal with in terms of what I thought was true and were not true, in, in a sense, I finally came away with uh, the idea that science is so complex, so complex, so complex, there's so much to know, especially in this area of food and health, but at the same time, it's so important. It's extraordinarily important uh, as to what we think we know now. And so I found myself, in a sense, as sort of being very involved in looking at details and working out details in the early part of my career, but finally getting to a point where I began to realize that there's more here than I could possibly fathom. I mean, I, I, I got ideas or observations that I could sell meat if I wanted to, <laughs> or anything else because of all the detailed kind of information that we can have. Finally, I've ended up at a point where, that I'd like to share with you here, is that as I look back over the complexities of science and enormous amounts of observations that are sometimes difficult to understand, especially if you haven't been in science, there's a couple of ideas that really stand out. One of them is this. It really has to do with protein. It really has to do with protein. I hope I can make that apparent uh, here in this lecture because what we need now, maybe two things. We, I mean, science is going to continue to advance ideas, discover new things. There's no question about that. All kinds of chemicals and plants and foods and so forth and so on, they can do various things. But at some point in time, we had to kind of stand back. And in a sense, sort of do a, look, take a 35,000 foot view of principles. I just wrote that here just before I came up here because Dr. Lee stimulated me so much and, and, and a lot of new things that I had heard, uh, some of the same kind of details. Um, and, and Dr. Esselton, in turn, just to compare the two of them, I've known Dr. Esselton for a long time. He's sitting back with Dr. Ornish and others actually looking at the end game and, and have a look to see what people really do and how they manage this. So I. Being in science, I want to share with you 
in, in a sense. The, the kind of grand 30,000 foot level, see what we can extract from that. In order to do that, I want to go back and share some of my own ideas in the beginning to got me to that particular point. So here's a proposition. It's what we all talk about, basically. The whole food plant-based diet does more to create health than all the pills and procedures combined. I know for some people, that's a pretty strident message. That really is. Those who have been trained and cultured and you sort of practice in health and medicine and so forth and so on tend to object to that, to say the least, uh, because uh, I'm being too bold, maybe too assertive, but I really believe it. Whole food, plant-based diets have more to create health and all the pills and procedures combined, period. The second thing is, having said that, in a sense, and believing it, I also have to say, too, this. Nowhere else in the health world is there information so profoundly important, yet so misunderstood as the whole food plant-based diet. I live in a territory where I have to, I'm sort of in, this, in the ocean, like an aisle between these two particular points of view. I actually spent about 20 years as part of my career involved in policy development in Washington and other capitals having to do with helping to develop, being members of expert panels and that sort of thing, helping to develop national policy in this area and watching this information kind of unfold. And, and I say I'm somewhat disappointed with my colleagues in my own field as well as in the policy area picking this up. Uh, and on the other hand, talking to the public like you folks here, I see a lot of enthusiasm beginning to evolve. So um, I, I've really gotten sort of more and more interested in how do we bridge that gap between what we tend to know in science, what we think we know, together with the policymakers and regulators and other people who are basically informing us. Um, so that's where that Proposition 2 really comes from, in a sense, is there's it's, it's a lot of pushback, and I'm sure you may know that. Some of it's very quite serious. Um, and I know that question that was asked here about Dr. Grundy and the lectin thing is a case in point, and I happen to agree totally, 100% with what Dr. Lee just said. Sometimes we have these things come up, get a lot of publicity, and quite frankly, in that particular case, I became quite concerned about it because it was a, basically a rather subtle attack on the kind of things that we talk about, to be honest about it. So my son, who co-authored the book with me, now a physician uh, organizing his own research program in cancer, we did a podcast, I guess, or what do you call them, webinars, I guess it was, if any of you might be interested. Dr. Grundy had not done any research in this area. There was another motivation there to get that going. So here, before I get into the details of this, uh, let me just say that uh, what I'm talking about is a whole food, plant-based diet, uh, not quite frankly a vegan or vegetarian diet. Uh, the motivations for taking that particular course uh, for individuals is uh, very laudable, it's great, I support that. But quite frankly, uh, there's some difficulties with those two kinds of diets. One of which is this. This is the latest, to my knowledge at least, the latest good set of data from a large study in Europe showing uh, the comparison of meat, vegetarian, and vegan diets. Notice this here. The total fat content of vegan, vegetarian, and meat eating diets is the same. Remarkable. Remarkable. You think it'd be a little bit different. But in, in fact, what that tends to do is to, in my view, is to compromise the ability of the vegetarian and vegan diets, theoretically, to compromise the kind of effects that they might have. Uh, at the same time, Comparing those three diets, and it's a big study, by the way, it's the largest of its kind, as far as I'm aware, uh, that the sugar content, that's the free sugar, if you will, the refined sugar, the content of those three diets is the same. So I had some difficulty. I'd like to use the whole food plant-based diet. I actually uh, one of the, was the one, I believe, that first uh, offered that uh, statement. I was on a, a government panel at the time where I was attempting to defend some of the things we were doing. And I didn't particularly want to use the vegetarian and vegan words because they didn't really convey the idea that it was totally based on science. Just one of the reasons. Um, I got my background from the farm. As I say, uh, I guess it's been eight, nine years now or so ago. Um, that's me on the front of the combine there. <laughs> so I grew up on a dairy farm. I was the first one to go to college, actually. 
I was really quite excited about the, the idea of going to college, let alone to graduate school. Then I went to Cornell University and did my doctoral dissertation on promoting the consumption, or figuring out was my major professor, um, it was his idea, I should say, but in any case, promoting better ways to produce protein. So we eat more protein, especially high quality protein, animal based protein. That's where I came from. So from my farm background to my graduate studies, it was all about, in a sense, trying to figure out how does animal protein work. I mean, it's good stuff, we thought. Um, so it's basically promoting more protein consumption. Then in the early part of my career, one of my first permanent sort of positions in a way was at Virginia Tech, actually, in biochemistry at Virginia Tech. I was involved with my senior colleague in putting together a nationwide program of feeding malnourished children. And there, the idea was to solve the protein gap. The idea was is that in countries that are poor, they got higher preponderance of uh, malnourished children, we got to solve that problem. And it was really all about, so we thought in those days, to make sure these kids got enough protein. In any case, over so there, trying to basically uh, make sure we, the, these Filipino children got enough protein. Um, and I sh should say that I, it's left an imprint on my mind all the years since. One of my primary initiatives to get into research and get really serious about trying to understand things was actually working with malnourished and starving children. I'll never forget that. And as I look back, it's one of the things of, that I really wanted to know. You know, how can we work out some nutrition information that's more useful to more people? It turns out that one day I was on the golf course, actually with my colleague in medicine, uh, who was a surgeon at the time, he told me how he and a couple of his colleagues were working on children aged four and under who had liver cancer. And I thought that's really kind of odd because liver cancer doesn't tend to occur in young people. It tends to occur in middle-aged and older. And so it didn't make sense. But that's what he said. Um, and then I, I, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. I wasn't sure I really believed it. But then there was this report that came from India, working with laboratory animals where they, in their case, in this case, these researchers, like me to some extent, were interested in trying to figure out what causes liver cancer. Kind of a unique cancer in some ways in the West, but it's common in, in other countries. Uh, they wanted to figure out how does liver cancer form. And we had an idea in those days in science that there was a particular chemical called aflatoxin that could actually initiate cancer. And we all thought that was probably the chief, chief cause of liver cancer in the world. But he was interested, these researchers were interested, to see if they could reduce the, the, uh, the effectiveness of, of that aflatoxin to cause cancer by giving more protein. So was there enthusiasm for protein. I mean, it's protein to everything all around the world. We think protein, protein, protein is really good. So they wanted to organize all this study, and they did. Experimental animals, in this case, they exposed two groups of animals to the same level of carcinogen to initiate the cancer in an experimental sense. And then they gave them two levels of protein. One was 20% of total calories. The other was 5%. 20, that range, incidentally, is more or less somewhat similar to human experience. And the amount of protein required by rats is about the same of, as us, in a sense. So their hypothesis was, give more protein, you won't get much cancer. That was their thought. They did a study, and what did they see? Exactly the opposite. They didn't believe their own research, actually. They went back and did the study again to try to prove it wrong. And it wasn't until about 25 years later that they invited me to India, actually, to discuss our differences of opinion. But in any case, the higher protein, you can see the result there. It's spectacular. It couldn't be more spectacular than that. Small study, admittedly. Now, not very convincing in that sense. But 100% got the cancer with the higher protein, the others none. That's a, big, that's a big effect. They didn't need a statistician to tell what's going on there, <laughs> obviously. But what, what was striking about that was the fact that the, in this particular experimental setting, the higher protein is turning on cancer. I am there in the Philippines with my colleague trying to build a program for children to eat more protein. Obviously, that resonated. Didn't know for sure that's true, but nonetheless, it was there. 
we had to answer in our conscious. I mean, I couldn't live with that without going back and doing some research. So I, I came back home from the Philippines and got a grant from the NIH, uh, a grant that then subsequently lasted for the next 27 years, the same that particular grant did, basically from the National Cancer Institute. So all of my research, I should comment, was from uh, the public money. That particular study, starting off this crazy little idea, maybe serious, uh, actually got me into the whole question concerning you know, how does cancer work? How does nutrition work? That's really what it was. I mean, you can't walk away from something like this. And so I really got interested, first off, to see if we could replicate what the Indian workers had done. And the second sort of general purpose, too, was to, as I say, let's learn how it works. I'm a biochemist, largely by training, and so I wanted to know, which one of those mechanisms in the cell, for example, or in the body might be triggering the high protein effect. Okay, so first off, let's do this here. We, we did many studies over many years, published this extensively. Uh, I want to just show you just a couple of ideas. Because what came from this, what came from this was the discovery of what I consider to be principles. Principles of nutrition. Principles of cancer. Because principles, for me, is the kind of fundamental kinds of things that work in the cell, in the body, that then can be used to extrapolate to other situations. I mean, really fundamental sort of nutritional characteristics. Here's a little study here. 12 week study. X axis, 12 weeks. You can see it there. Uh, we started with a genetic mutation. That aflatoxin compound we thought was a carcinogen was used to cause a mutation. Everybody know what a mutation is? It's the normal DNA being converted to, to the, to the cancer-producing DNA in theory. At least some of the mutations can occur that way. And in fact, a, ge a genetic mutation is the situation where the DNA, the gene, if you will, has been sort of, in a sense, uh, mutated. It's, it's been um, hit by a chemical carcinogen, maybe, usually gets repaired. But in any case, good DNA is converted to bad DNA. Okay, that's what we got. So in this study here, we've got a situation where there's bad DNA being formed. That's how cancer starts. So the animal's given 5% protein. You got the little green line, dotted line on the bottom. No growth. Now, in contrast, that red dotted line, it jumps two spaces there, but that red dotted line, that's 20%. Cancer really growing well, just like what the Indian workers had done. Then the next question was to ask, what, what if we change that diet you know, during the course of that development? Well, the first three weeks, we give them 20%. That's the bar. Then 5%, 20%, 5%. I mean, again, a very experimental setting, not related to anything much at this particular point in time. But that was really spectacular, in my view. And this is the first time, and still today, I think this is the first time this was demonstrated in science. The whole idea that in an experimental setting, you can start cancer, and you can turn it on and turn it off by nutrient means. In this particular case, it was a protein. So the high protein diet turns it on, 5% turns it off. That still today is a really substantial, has substantial importance I think that it hasn't been recognized. Because cancer tends to be regarded as a genetic disease. All you need is to have the genes, the bad genes. If you've got to make it for cancer, essentially. Well, and, and, there, and that cancer does, it's not, can't get reversed, so to speak. This is what we're showing here. Yes, we can turn cancer on and off. Very exciting proposition. I'm really today far more convinced of that, not just based on this rather simple little study. That is really an important consideration. So there's one more aspect of that that's kind of interesting. So we, in this case, this is done, incidentally, this is done before the Human, human Genome Project. So, you know, science didn't know that much about DNA and genes and stuff like that. Uh, but I was interested to see, what if we fed the 5% for, let's say, nine weeks? For nine weeks? We would think that carcinogen is now gone. No more mischief around there. So we just gave 20%, and it turned out, there it comes, popped up. 
that led to this concept that I, I, I find to be equivalent to gra growing grass seed. If we make a lawn, you spread, you make a nice soil, soil bed, you spread seeds around, consider the seeds, that's carcinogens, you put the grass down and the grass will grow. The more seeds, you get more grass. The grass will grow when the temperature is up, sun is shining, enough water, right, and fertilizer is there. It'll grow. But then the grass grows nicely. When the, when it gets, when the temperature goes down, like winter time, the grass dies. Looks like it dies. It's brown. Or when it has no water, go into a drought period, the grass becomes brown. But then when we, we recover the conditions, more water, more sunshine, more light, if you will, more, more warmth, it starts growing again. This is the same analogy. This is the same analogy, which I find very quite interesting because it relates to something real in nature. That cancer will grow. And we, we all of us, I can tell you, all of us in here have some genes, some bad genes, if you will, kind of hanging around, not causing much mischief, frankly, for much of our lives. Unfortunately, some of us get problems. Uh, but the whole question of whether the cancer grows or doesn't grow becomes a nutritional experience. And again, that for me was a really pretty exciting idea. Turn it on or turn it off and that sort of thing. So then that's just the first 12 weeks. We wanted to go then to what happens over a whole lifetime of the animals, which is important. We did that too. Over the total 100 weeks, that's a normal life on the rats, by the way. Um, they're all living and have no cancer had 5% protein, even though they had been exposed to a heavy dose of carcinogen. In contrast, the animals fed to 20% by the end of what would be their lifetime. They were gone. They had died of cancer. So cancer in this particular case, in this particular model, cancer became a function of nutrition. That's what really kind of sent me down the path of getting kind of excited about what nutrition could do, particularly what protein does. I, I got to the point of confirming in my mind at least what the nanoworkers workers have done. Basically, high protein turns into cancer. The next question was then to understand what's the mechanism. Now, I could go through a lot of slides on this to tell you about those mechanisms. I won't. It took about 12 to 15 years with lots of graduate students looking at one mechanism of kind. Here's what we were doing. I wanted to find what was the key mechanism that is responsible, more than others, responsible for the cancer forming. Because if, I could find, if we could find out what the key mechanism is, then in theory, we could find a chemical, let's call it a drug, we can find a drug to stop that reaction. That is, in fact, the foundation of the vast majority of the pharmaceutical industry. The idea is if you, find, if you have something, you've got something here that can relate to this particular thing out here, this disease, and you want all of it to stop, come and find a chemical to weave in, in that system and then hit that, hit that reaction and stop it. So again, this kind of, now here what I'm gonna show, let's bring, come back to this slide. This is a little schematic showing a carcinogen, that's a C, actually being activated by an enzyme called mixed function oxidase, that's what the MFO stands for. It gets activated to bind to the DNA. That's the beginning of a mutation. The enzyme's converting it, right? Then the DNA, now it's set, now it's poised, getting ready to be a bad DNA. Fortunately, 99.99% of that gets repaired. It's going on all the time in our body, quite frankly, it turns out. These, this kind of thing is happening a lot in our bodies. But we have a fantastic nature, natural system in our bodies to repair much of that stuff. But occasionally the cell divides before it gets repaired. If the DNA doesn't repair itself, now you've got a little cancer cell. Now it's got the gene embedded in it that now can give rise to cancer. At that particular point, the body can jump in again. And another fail-safe mechanism, jump in there and block or kill those cells. They call them natural killer cells as part of the immune system. And so the body got a couple of mechanisms, and there's more. I'm just showing you what we knew in those days. So we got a couple of 
mechanism is just block it. And then, then the, by, if that doesn't get blocked, if you say, if you will, then all those stars there are a series of mechanisms that we look for. So what we, what we did, we were looking for the mechanism through that series of reactions to find out which one was which. I finally decided after about 12 to 15 years, there was no such thing as the mechanism. There was a whole host of mechanisms working sort of in a, in a sense at the same time. Almost like a tsunami of mechanisms. Feet high protein is coming in there and doing all this dirty work by all kinds of different mechanisms. But what was really interesting about that is that of the 10 we had at the time, of the 10 mechanisms we sort of looked at, eight of them were increased, and in every case that meant more cancer. So the high protein diet was actually turning on cancer, right? There were two mechanisms that were turned down. Guess what? There were the two mechanisms, I showed the little bars there. The two mechanisms that are, are fail-safe mechanisms, we have something to protect us, the high protein diet comes in and knocks it out. So here was something really excited, I thought, because um, the high protein diet, as I say, is operating in a way, it's changing everything all around and creating this dramatic response. That's a, fun, that's a fundamental idea of what nutrition is. Nutrients don't work alone to create a response by one mechanism. There's a whole lot of stuff going at the same time that gets very complex, extraordinarily complex, but at least to a sort of a principle in a sense. I put this word here, immunotherapy, and just after sitting here listening to Dr. Lee, <laughs> you know, talking about you know, immunotherapy is a situation where the immune system is called into action, in a sense, to produce some cells. They could kill cancer cells, that's what they're doing. One of the things is these natural killer cells, we could talk about that for the next couple of hours, but in any case, this was back in the days of late, early 90s, actually, late 80s, uh, when this was first then uh, discovered as natural killer cells. So we took the high protein diet, and what does a high protein diet do? It backs, basically, these natural killer cells were good things. The body wants to make them. The protein just, actually, the high protein cut that off and the body and the immune system couldn't produce them. So now with all the immunotherapy excitement that's going on now in the field today, I have to tell you, the research that we were doing back 25, 30 years ago really was, we were demonstrating, yes, the immune system is important in many different ways, but it turns out it's nutrition largely controls that immune system. Really, an, again, a very significant idea, I think. Because when we have the right kind of nutrition, it begs the question, what's good nutrition, of course? But we have the right kind of nutrition, and I would argue it's one that's low in animal protein, then the immune system is going to tend to activate itself, get in good order, do good things. And so, once again, all these mechanisms are operating, no such thing uh, doing that. Uh, by this time, this is now like, I don't know what it was, 25 years, 30 years, something like that. Uh, at that particular point in time, I'm really getting excited about what not just protein does, but also with what nutrition does in general, because the principles applying, the principles that we are ferreting out from the studies on protein was also, interestingly, were equivalent to other nutrients as well. When we are consuming the right food, right nutrients, we get the right results, that's what it comes down to. Now, you stop just for a second. This is a curveball that I had found a little bit difficult to deal with at the time and why I told you where it came from. The protein we were using for, I, I guess I'm kind of, was kind of ignorant about this, we're not paying a lot of attention, it was just a protein we could actually purchase. We were using protein and it was casein. Casein is the main protein of cow's milk. That's why I said I grew up on a farm growing you know, milk and cows <laughs> and then going off to school trying to figure out you know, how to produce more of that kind of protein. In reality, the protein we were using to turn on the cancer is casein. Can you get that? The casein was turning on the cancer. I mean, that took me a couple of years of digesting, no pun intended. But in any case, there it was. We tried then uh, plant proteins to see if they would maybe do the same thing. Not, they didn't do it. Soy protein, wheat protein, 
did not increase this cancer development even when they are fed up to that 20% level. So another sort of image or let's say the, the proposition of a new principle coming into play was really quite interesting. Animal proteins do one thing, plant proteins do something different. I mean, that's the inference of this, it's not proof, but it's the inference, and that's the way it worked. It turns out, with a little passing of time, with some work of my colleagues as well, animal proteins, yes, they do not good things. The animal proteins have been shown very clearly. You have a whole bunch of animal proteins, if you test them, they all tend to increase blood cholesterol levels, and they stimulate the production of early heart disease, acrogenesis. The plant proteins do the opposite. So you got this two sort of world views in a sense, world sort of collections of effects. Animal proteins up to mischief, plant proteins not. Again, and that's sort of expansion of the idea of things are bigger, broader in terms of effects than what one might imagine. But we can kind of slice, cut that uh, world up of protein. Animal proteins over here, plant proteins over there in many ways. There's some differences between plant proteins and there's some different most of themselves and some differences. For plant proteins, it depends on what they're measured against. But in, the big question is, all the animal proteins are here, more or less the plant proteins are there. It's another kind of question I can't get into right here. But all of a sudden is merging for me is this idea that, plant, that the protein, especially animal-based protein, that above the level of protein we need, and I have to point that out, we all need protein. We didn't, if we didn't have protein, we wouldn't be sitting here. We need protein, it's an essential nutrient. But we did some studies to sort of sort out how is the amount of protein needed relate to the mischief it causes? And how is the difference between plant and animal proteins? So it turns out, the amount of protein we need is around 9, 10%, or at least the amount recommended is around 9 to 10% of total calories. The minimum level from a research perspective is around 5 or 6% protein. That's all we need, really, to meet the minimum needs. But it's been, the RDA, the recommended doctor allowance, has been set at the, about 8, 9, 10%, somewhere in that territory. All that protein up to that point, even if it were only animal protein, all that protein up to that particular point, the body chooses it to use it for good purposes. If we go in excess of that, if we go in excess of that by consuming more of what most of us think is protein, animal foods, we get the problems. So the studies that we were doing, uh, I'm jumping over a lot of hoops here, but basically uh, when the protein is when animal proteins are fed in the excess of the amount of protein we need, cancer starts going, cholesterol is synthesized at higher levels and lots of other things to begin to appear. Here's, incidentally, so then you come to questions concerning food. What does all this mean in reference to food? Well, animal protein, we know what that is. Obviously, it's animal foods. Uh, and the contrast is plant foods, obviously. Looking at some other nutrients, here's a little chart here, simple chart showing that plants have antioxidants. They, they really have mostly antioxidants, so now we know antioxidants are really, really important. If there's a, if a, gold, if there's a gold star bunch of nutrients, I would argue it really is the, animal, the uh, antioxidants, by the way. But we also, plants have complex carbohydrates. That's the dietary fiber, by the way, and some other things. Um, and so the plants, <laughs> complex carbohydrates come from plants. Vitamins, there might be a little bit of a question here for that, but vitamins in the classical sense by which we identify them are produced by plants. Vitamin D, by the way, is not a vitamin, nor is vitamin A. The both that can be made, so they're not, really should not be considered vitamins. But in any case, vitamins are crucial little, uh, cr crucial nutrients used in micro amounts that do big things. We absolutely need them. So you see plants doing, producing all these good things. Animals don't, animal foods don't have that good stuff. Fat and protein, we need both. We need a certain level, and it's about around 9, 10%, 11% maybe for those two. And that's just fine. That's just fine. But when we go in excess of that, we can get into trouble, especially if we're using animal foods to get there. So that's what level of chart means. So the difference between animal foods and plant foods is huge. 
you know, from a nutritional perspective. Really, really huge. And so what happens, going back to my recommended diet to allow thing a little bit, if we consider total food intake to be a zero-sum game, let's call it calories, because it's really calories we try to get into our bodies on a regular basis. If we assume that total food consumption more or less is weighted as a zero-sum game, when we start sticking in the animal protein, because it's so valuable, so we thought for 150 years, as soon as we start sticking in animal protein into that mix, and protein has some calories too, then what happens, we're going to see the adverse effects of the animal protein begin to appear. And most importantly, we're going to be seeing a decrease in the consumption of the foods that matter. It's a very important point, and this tends to be admitted, admitted in epidemiological studies uh, during the last 100 years or so, is that you, you kind of have to look at the data in a sense to realize that plants, by the way, has all the protein we need. It makes, I mean, even potatoes, just eat potatoes all day long, run 8%, 9% or so like that. It, it makes our protein needs. That's not what we do, it's for other reasons we don't need to do that, obviously, but just to make the point. But because of our reverence, our historical and cultural reverence for protein, that goes back to the early 1800s, we think we must have protein, it must be at the center of the plate. In fact, some of the early researchers were calling this protein, and it was animal-based at the time, they were calling the stuff of civilization itself medical people. So there was a, quite an ethic that Siri, uh, that evolved in during that history to be, to revere protein so much. And always, it was always thought to be basically animal based. No, it's not. Plants provide all the protein we need. Some other, there's another thought here that I want to put into the equation. During the last Surely, during the last 50 years or so, we've seen an emergence of a lot of products called processed foods. And I, I call them, I almost want to call them convenience foods <laughs> because we find them in convenience stores. You know, you stop along the road, you get your, whatever your cookies and candies and et cetera, et cetera. Those, those, those kinds of foods, processed foods, let's call them processed foods, they're likely to be worse. Almost even, even in animal foods, they're certainly, certainly maybe it's bad. Because what they're doing when we consume it in that form is not the whole food. What it's doing is displacing the consumption of plant foods, whole plant foods. So for a variety of reasons, nutritional reasons, they tend to create dif uh, difficulties, just like to some extent animal foods do. So there's only only one class of foods that matter if we're interested in health. It's all plant-based foods, okay? It's not the meats and really not the uh, processed foods. That's what this is sort of showing. When uh, I wrote the China study with my son, my youngest son, uh, who was at the time a writer and an actor. He was not a scientist. Um, but in any case, uh, when we were doing this in 2002 and 2005 or so, I'm trying to sort things out. And what, it, what I had come to know, I sense, and I sort of thought I knew some of this, I wanted to know how much does this apply to other, uh, other uh, diseases? What other research is out there to, to do this? And so we found evidence in the literature had been ignored for the most part. Some was kind of preliminary, some was more convincing, but all these diseases here seem to respond in the same way. Eating animal foods, that's what the previous literature shows. That's an easy way to be interpreted. Animal foods cause problems, plant foods causes solutions. That's really what it was. And you can see some of the diseases here are are uh, pretty prominent. Heart disease. I said I got a phone call one day after our work was uh, in the New York Times when we were doing a study in China. And by the way, the China study it was a project we did in China to actually look at a large population, collect a lot of information to see how to see whether it was consistent with what we were looking at in the laboratory. My background came from laboratory, totally, but. When we got to the China study to do that survey, it turned out this rather large amount of information we, we collected turned out to be consistent with what we saw in the laboratory. Uh, in any case, after it was announced in the New York Times, and I got a phone call from this guy. 
wanting to know if I'd come and talk to a conference of his in Arizona, and he told me about he was taking people, and he was essentially using this kind of diet and reversing heart disease. He's sitting right over there, Dr. Esselton. And so um, he and I sort of became friends. I was really impressed with what he had done. Dr. Ornish as well was doing it at the time. And so um, there you have it. We, I was sort of coming to this point of view from science, but when I heard that, heard, I mean, that was really big stuff, that you could actually get, do that with people. Since then, just to jump ahead, as we do our so-called immersion programs, short term, as we do that kind of thing, we're seeing now, and many of you may know this, when you make a switch from an animal-based kind of diet to a plant-based diet, then, then all kinds of problems that you may have, some you may not even realize you have, begin to resolve. So it's a very broad effect, and that's what this chart here did. We wrote it down in the China study just because I thought, wow, this thing, this thing is working. It's consistent with a lot of information we already had. You know, it just hadn't been, I guess, quite told this way. So the whole food plant-based diet effect is, as far as the nutritional uh, activity of this kind of food is concerned, is very broad in scope. One more, I would call, big principle idea. Think about the drugs. We are living in a world where we try to be healthy, in a sense, by using single nutrient, or single chemicals called drugs. We're going to resolve our problems that way, uh, when in fact, nutrition can do all of that better and much easier without side effects. There's a number of people now in the country, friends of mine, colleagues, and so forth, are doing this kind of stuff. We see results in, in, in 10 days, two weeks. I actually, was, got very really interested in doing that after hearing about Dr. Esselton's work where he was taking his heart patients and he told me that he saw results pretty fast. So we, we started doing something similar. You now lots of people are doing that kind of thing. It's, and if, if this dietary change is sustained, that's the idea. This is not a drug protocol. You know, you got a problem, you jump in there and you're going to do this kind of diet and then, and then after a while you feel pretty good and then you go back to doing what you did before. No, it doesn't work that way. This, this is what we're talking about in this case, it has to be sustained. And when that happens, I think you get one of the most exciting ideas of all. It really has to do, in my view, with the future of this field. We talk about the whole food plant-based diet. Well, I should, I should say, we have talked about the whole food plant-based diet actually preventing disease. I'm putting that word treatment in there. This kind of diet actually treats illness and disease essentially with little or no side effects. Vastly different from trying to rely on the use of drugs. No comparison. So it's fast, it's broad. It's not just about prevention, it's also about treatment. And I would suggest that for the future of this field, in many ways, if you can go to someone, and some of you have had this experience, I know, got a problem, or friends and family have a problem, get them on this. Just watch the results. It's absolutely spectacular. So I'm going to also argue, too, that the evidence that we now have is good and sound. It's not iffy. There's not other kinds of diets that come along and try to displace this idea. This is, this is really it. On that point, let me just show you. I went back and got some charts just recently out of the literature, <coughs> hopefully to make this point. These are, and I'm going to show you a series of charts real quick here that actually have been published, the work of others. Different populations in this case, different investigators. All of them were focused on, in one way or another, as animal protein. Although I should tell you that, I'm going to show you a series of them. Some of them were, is talking about animal protein, they called it things like skim milk. Or they called it uh, saturated fat. In other words, they had other surrogate kind of uh, indicators of animal protein. So, okay, there's animal protein for breast cancer. That initially was saturated fat. But saturated fat and animal protein have a very high correlation. When you measure one, you see the other. Now, these are what we call correlation studies, okay? We'll come back to that point, just correlation studies. But what is interesting about this, this is a friend of mine, Ken Carroll, 1975, 
that line, that regression line, goes right down through there, through the, right through the XY origin at the bottom. What that says in theory, more, a little more in theory, it says reality, as soon as some animal protein is put in the diet, we can see some theoretical increase in risk for breast cancer. So it's sort of saying, you know, it just it putting it, kind of kibosh on the animal protein in a sense. If that's what we're worried about, it goes right through the SY origin. Here's for, that was mortality, that was death rate. There's another study, different country, another investigator, I'm just showing it to show how it gets replicated. But breast cancer incidence, same thing. Right through the origin, essentially. Urine cancer. These are different parts. Urine cancer. This is total fat, but it shows essentially the same thing. Um, colon cancer. Look at that. Every time when you put it against, um, in this case, it was meat consumption. That's, that's protein, essentially. We can interpret all of these as either a direct measure of the animal protein. That's usually not done. Or we can use other things that are surrogates for animal protein consumption. There's uh, kidney cancer. Prostate cancer. Prostate cancer, by the way, I think, I forget what it was Dr. Essen and Dr. Lee said something about this. The prostate cancer relationship with um, animal protein intake and calcium, the relationship between prostate cancer and skim milk, by the way, that relationship is, is, is as strong or stronger than the relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Really quite incredible. Here's a little bit torturous. Coronary heart disease, cholesterol. Heart disease goes up, that's on the y-axis, and the cholesterol at the bottom. Cholesterol in the, in the, across populations, cholesterol is really a function of animal protein intake. Not just because of the animal protein, but in large measure it is, and the kind of cholesterol too. So there's a big story here, but that's really what it comes out to be. And then there's this. Here's the relationship between animal protein as found by the author. This is 1959, Dr. Jolliffe. There's a relationship between animal protein intake and heart disease for different countries. Again, right through, all those, those slides, bang, 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 right through, all showing the same thing. As soon as you put animal protein in that diet, there's a bit of a problem. Just bring to your attention something, another issue here that's important in, in this sort of 30,000 foot idea and that is uh, the wholeness of food. The wholeness of food. That, that's the question I want to address here. There was data published, this is 1981. It's a three-dimensional uh, three plot, in a sense, showing the relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. How do I say it? On that one axis there, on that particular axis there, going to the right, on the right there, that's increasing the number of cigarettes used. And you can see, the more cigarettes smoked, the more the lung cancer. That's very clear. This was a study about 14,000 men in the Western Electric Company, published in 1981. Um, and so you see that increase. As cigarette, less cigarettes are used, less lung cancer come back. On the other axis, the one there on the left, in a sense, that's the amount of beta carotene, basically, in the blood. Beta carotene being a reflection of Beta carotene foods, essentially. Spinach and so forth, the greens. And what you can see there, if when smoking exposure is not too high, you don't see much of a beta carotene effect. When there's quite a lot of smoking going on, look at that dose response there, very really incredible. In other words, here's what it says. And I one time got quoted in this, and I was warned by my colleagues, my friends who were with the WHO not to say that again, but basically it sort of shows the theory that you know, heavy smokers can smoke as long as they eat their carrots with it. I mean, that's not, was not a very popular idea. And I'm certainly not, not what I'm promoting here by any means. But what this does show is this rather extraordinary effect of beta carotene, in this case, a nutrient, is a pro-vitamin A, on being able to depress you know, the production of that. That being said, what was generally known at that time, it wasn't just me, it was others even more so in the field, saying, oh, beta carotene, more beta carotene in the blood, eat that kind of food, or we get less lung cancer, right? So a big study was organized, joint study between 
Finland and the United States with US money. They did this study, it was intended for eight years. What they did, they had smokers, non-smokers, or smokers to different degrees actually in the study. But what they did then was to see what relationship there might be between beta carotene and smoking risk. And they did it two ways. First off, they just simply measured how much was being consumed. That was pretty normal, divided up that way. And the other way they did it was to put in a pill. They took the beta carotene out and stuck in a pill. It's really good. It's an antioxidant. And so they got the results actually earlier than they expected. Um, 29,000 smokers in this study. It was quite interesting. The beta carotene coming from the food was associated with a decreased risk of lung cancer, like that slide I just showed you. Down 20, 19% and highly significant. The supplement that beta carotene, stuff they put in the pills that should really work good, it was an increased risk. This shocked that world at the time, I can tell you. A huge furor came out. You know, somebody's playing with the data and so forth and so on. Uh, but in reality, what it showed, at least from my perspective, and there's been many studies showing this, when a nutrient's in the food, it's doing good stuff. When we take it out and put it in a pill, no. We've got quite a lot of evidence now that when they're put in foods and we make these supplements, if you will, they don't work. Or they may actually, may in some cases, increase risk. It's really quite striking. So it makes a real major distinction between eat it and the food. When we talk about nutrients, go to the food. You know, not go to the supplements. We, you know, in, in nutritional science and in medicine and the public at large, me too, you know, at, at point, we tend to think of nutrition as one thing at a time. We'll fish out this nutrient or that chemical or some other. We're going to do something. We're going to put it in something. We're going to sell it. We do a little study on it. We find, oh, this looks good. You know, we, we, what, whatever. We, we find lycopene in tomatoes, I recall that story. You know, it reduces the first study that was done and showed a lower risk for prostate cancer. Oh, then sell lycopene, reduce car prostate cancer risk. And so it goes. I can tell hundreds of those kinds of examples in the last number of years. We find a nutrient, we put it in a pill or sell it or sell some concentrated form of it in order to resolve some specific problem. I'm concerned. That doesn't work. That's not what we're talking about. So this brings me to this slide here. Thinking about there's something more here that we should think, be thinking about than what we tend to think. When I say we, I'm obviously talking about you know, the professionals as well as the public, as well as you know, our forefathers before us. If you look at food, here's a theoretical pathway of what happens to a food when we eat it. It goes through a series of stages as that food is being broken down into its different nutrients. It turns out, and this is something we know from science, each one of these stages, as the nutrient works from one phase to the next, we know more or less the proportion that gets digested. We know less, more or less the proportion that gets absorbed. We know a lot about how, how it's carried in the blood, whether it's active or inactive. We know how much gets into cells. And we talk about those numbers, they make big stories. You know, only 10% of the calcium gets absorbed in one study, and another study, all 40% gets absorbed. In any case, each one of these stages, it varies. There is no set number, unlike what you might hear. There's no set number, it's varying. And a re really important point, it varies every nanosecond. There's, you cannot, there's no fixed time, no fixed number. And so when you go through that whole thing, you might know how much is in a spoon of a nutrient, but it has nothing to do with how much actually ends up at the active site in the cell. So all of a sudden, this, this says something here. This says, you know, we put so much focus on how much nutrients are in foods. We put so much focus on how much nutrient we should be consuming. It, it's not really the way to do it. That's what we've done for 100 years or close to it. When we consume food, the amount that actually gets digested, transported, delivered, functions, so forth and so on, that's a function of the body. That's a function of nature. We scientists, you know, we get smug at times and say, oh, we know this number, we know that number, so forth and so on. In reality, the body is the master. And as long as we rely on the, the, the mechanism we have there, it will tend to decide for itself how much to do this, how much to pass on, so forth, where to take it, and do, do its work. It's a really exciting idea. It's, it's what I call holism, 
eventually, not quite at this point, whatever in theory we might have learned in an experiment, how much is actually transferred from this one to that one to that one, we can learn those things to some extent. Whatever we might have learned or think we know, it's going to change as soon as we add another nutrient in there. This is such a dynamic system. This is such a dynamic system that we should be careful of how we use science. And we shouldn't really focus so much on the individual amounts of any specific thing because it's all working together. That leads us to the concept, in my, in my view, the concept of holism. Very active, all the time, going on as you sit there. 10 to 100 trillion cells in our bodies. And every one is like a universe unto itself. Hugely complex. You can sit on the head of a pin, you can't see a cell. And in every one of those cells in our body, all this stuff is going on. And somebody's around, and there's nature at work, deciding on how best to use that. And the default position of nature, quite frankly, is to create health. Leave the body alone, eat the right food, back away, let nature take its course. I think, I think it's a really good way to look at it. One more step in this complexity idea. Here's a chart showing a bunch of reactions in biochemistry. Some of you in this area may have in science or medicine, you'll know these terms, glycolysis and Krebs cycle. These are, these are initial reactions going down through there. I actually taught biochemistry myself for some years, and I was at the age then, early in my career, that was kind of exciting to see these things, learn about these reactions, tell the students about them. What, what was coming out at that time, though, it was a very active, dynamic time in science because somebody was discovering a new reaction. And we were making these metabolic charts and maps and competing with each other in biochemistry. Put, who's, who's got the latest map, map and put it on the wall with all the reactions building up and so forth and so on? And finally, it gets this. So, and that came some years ago because this is only a small portion of our now know. Biochemistry has so many reactions that we cannot comprehend. Not even the best of our computers will put this, put this all this story together to see how they relate to each other. But here it is. We, we, but we tend to think, we tend to jump ahead. We found the reaction. Remember I told you about finding the mechanism? We'll find the one that does something we don't like. I won't go make a chemical. I won't stop it. We'll block it. We'll call it a drug. And so the question is, how can one reaction work? You know, with no, with no, well, first off, what that really means to say is, can one reaction work? And you know, with multiple side effects, when we do it that way, to try to hit that one target, we get a lot of side effects, and we all know. Especially every drug has side effects. So that's the other part of the game, that they have side effects. That's your drug protocol. Nutrition protocol is different. We don't have to try to sit back and try to figure out every little detail, which reaction does what, or how much we should put in there to solve some problem. Because nutrition, with infinite numbers of chemicals that we might call nutrients, all from plants, by the way, all that stuff is working together. And so we don't have to think about whether it's going to get this reaction and that one, whether it's the prostate or the breast or whatever. The body's looking out for itself and it's taking care of things. So it all really works. And this, is, this concept has been known for more than 200 years. Not exactly in this form. We didn't have the information then. But in spirit, this, this concept was there at that time. So I come to this, this idea of calling nutrition holist with a W. When I wrote this book, Whole, I was thinking about it, how to express this, and I thought it was holism. You spell it with an H, and that's, some, that's kind of anathema to science. There's always been this debate between <laughs> holistic thinking and real science. Uh, and I looked at the dictionaries, and the dictionaries, Oxford and, and uh, the other, the, what was it, Webster, they didn't spell it with a W in it, so I put the W in it, and I hope it'll stay there, because the concept of holism, it's really everything working together. Fantastic concept. All kinds of diseases that we 
kind of divide up, and we call this and the disease X and this and Y, and this is something, something we call idiopathic, because we can't think out a name. And so you know, we have all these diseases, and the right food just works on them all together. There's multiple nutrients, multiple mechanisms, multiple disease reversal. You can see it there. All comes down to a whole food plant-based diet. I think when we think of evidence this way, and start, stand back and acknowledge what nature is and how nature works, and do some analysis going, going forward, the more complex kinds of analysis with statistics and things, this is the end game. There's no other diet. There's no other diet can challenge this. Low carb or, I hope you don't hear it. <laughs> Somebody's ringing me. I think that's the dairy industry calling me. <laughs> so, um, I say this is a highly interactive, integrated whole system without making animal protein a cult. It's time to call it what it is. It's a cult. Unfortunately, 95% of this in our society, or 99% of what it is, got caught up in that cult. And we find it very really difficult to challenge our beliefs in this system. A lot of people do. But now we're getting what I call empirical data, real data, facts. We think about it correctly. And then we test it. We get to give it to people, see what happens, like Dr. Ornish and others have done. And see what happens. We can study all the details, that's fun. We can learn these kind of things, but in reality, what we have to not forget is this is really a whole food plant-based thing. I wrote a paper on this published last year for any of you in science, you might be interested in this one. I want to introduce a new age of nutrition. Nutrition has not been acknowledged in the professions. My own field of nutritional science has done a very bad job because we've been working also on the idea of individual nurses doing this, that, and everything else. So this is something here, I make an argument that if we understand nutrition properly and we tell the public this, and then we stand back and we develop public policy in a sense, the accomplishments can be huge. They can really, really be huge if we just simply understand it this way. That's nutrition. Medicine and medical practice, and I should say, and many of you may know this, there's no medical school in the United States that really teaches nutrition to its students. There's one or two, maybe had 10, 15 lectures, or something, they call it nutrition, but it's not. So nutrition is not part of the medical game plan. So doctors don't get trained in this area, it's sad. These great young people going to school, you know, want to work with people, what they want to understand. They're not being trained in what I call the premier biomedical science of the future. Do you know, actually, that in some count I looked at, there's about 130 or so medical specialties that's recognized by the Medicare system, for example. 130 or so medical specialties, one for cancer, one for this, you know, different kinds of cancers. There's not one that's dedicated to nutrition. That's how nutrition has been left out of the system. Physicians who are, are leaders, the ones out there doing the workforce, relating to the public, are not trained in the area, and worst of all, if there's no medical specialty, they cannot be reimbursed for their services. It's really a horrific system we live in. A horrific system we live in. That is a change, and that can be changed. So reductionist medicine, one disease, here's the way we look at practice of medicine, one disease, one cause, one mechanism, one drug treatment, whatever. And the drugs that we use are basically all foreign chemicals. We don't use them as such. We actually, they can't be patented that, that way. So we have to synthesize derivatives of them. That's another whole issue. This is why holistic nutrition is not taught in reductionist medical schools. We're talking about two different universes. Here's the universe over here having to do with nutrition. Creates health. Do it right. Do it right. Don't get the side effects. Get results. Over here, do something synthetic. Invent a chemical. Find a mechanism. Name a different disease. Name more diseases if we can't break it all up. We so we can have a, you know, a plan for everybody. And well, lastly, at the National Institutes of Health, 
where I've been very much involved over the years. They funded all of my research, the National Ed Cancer Institute, rather generously. Of the 28 institutes at NIH, the premier biomedical research agency in the world, of the 28 institutes and centers, there's not one institute that's dedicated to nutrition. So nutrition is not in training. Tr nutrition is not made part of, uh, made available for use and for physicians to get reimbursed for their services. And last, we don't do the research. It's got to change in a major way. One more paper I just did last year. I, I, I wish I could have time to talk about this. One of the ex most exciting parts of this idea, based on our ability to turn cancer on and off, is actually to argue the case that cancer can be treated with nutrition. Never been done. Not like what Dr. Essa and Dr. Ornish did. I'm really anxious for that to be done. And there's a reason for it, and I won't go through it here. Uh, we're getting ready to start on it. My younger son now has the funding to do a first stage cancer study on metastatic breast cancer using a whole food type based diet. So we're, we're kind of excited getting into that world. <laughs> if, if you stop and think about it, chemotherapy is the, has been at least, and now there's immunotherapy and stuff like that, but still a drug approach. Chemotherapy from the war and cancer days until recently, there's some data available on that. The average cost of making another chemotherapy agent, by the way, is two and a half billion dollars. Two and a half billion dollars. That counts uh, what they call opportunity cost loss if you invest it someplace else. Real out of pocket, or if you will, cost is 1.8 billion. But in any case, somewhere between 1.8 2 billion. So that's what it costs to make another chemotherapy agent. So, what, wait. We have to ask ourselves, are these wonderful drugs, are they working? There was a report put out in 2007. Now, that's 11 years ago. A joint study between some Australian and American scientists went back and collected all the data they could get from the cancer database in the United States and Australia. And they were just asking this question, are these things working? Big body of data, really a big body of data. It represented 22 different cancers. And they had a look to see if the, if the chemotherapy agent actually was increased in five-year survival rates. That's the normal thing to do. Yes, the, the chemotherapy agents increase cancer survival rates by 2.1%. Nothing. Nothing. There are a couple of cases where chemotherapy looks like it helps out and extends somebody's life for two months, maybe two or three or four years or something like that. But basically, chemotherapy is not working. So the attention now has turned to some extent, I'm, I'm, to my sense of it, to immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is an interesting idea. It's, it's an attempt to try to get the body to do what it should do. But once and again, they're going to use chemicals to treat the immune system to do what it supposedly does. And when in reality, we were doing that 25 years ago with nutrition. I'm going to argue that nutrition is where it's at. It just needs to be properly tested. We have one uh, online course that uh, is done in conjunction with partnership with Cornell University. We've been quite excited about it. Dr. Esselton was lecturing as well, and others, uh, my, my colleagues. And we, we put together something that has come up rather nicely, and it turns out that, if I can get it up here, it's all online. We've got instructors. It's three two-week courses. This is nonprofit, by the way. Also, I have to say, in case somebody wondered, I don't get paid for this. I get nothing, no uh, no payment of myself. But in any case, it, we give continuing medical education credits for health professionals, thirty uh, credits for uh, doctors. In any case, there it is for any of you who might be interested. We're very excited about continuing this. I want to make this a, a program that's based on the best of science, getting the best of colleagues to participate so that we can actually begin to sell it to the public, you know, so that we all can learn about this new idea of nutrition. We have a big website, it's now translated into Spanish, we're looking at a couple of other languages. I, I think of it, you know, I'm optimistic. 
I think we have information. We can go forward. We can solve problems big time, in my view. But here, here's one thing that happened just recently. Recently, it's actually 2002. For me, that's recent. <laughs> Uh, the dietary guidelines is the, the policy statement we all listen to. How much food, how much this, how much that. It's also the instrument used to provide backbone for the school lunch program and for many other programs. So what the dietary guidelines statement says every five years, first reviewed by scientists, then passed on to the politicians to decide whether or not to accept it. What that says is really important. In 2000, this has been active since 1980, in 2000, a report came out that it actually came out a couple years late. They did something different. As I said before, this is a line showing the different levels of protein intake related to what we do with it. Now, 5 6% is the protein we need. <coughs> 9 10% or so is the RDA. We should have that much. It can all be supplied by plants. But the, uh, the black line is the range that we actually use. is between 11 and about 22%, 95% of us. So we're in the territory above 10%, all really supplied by animal-based foods. In fact, the average of the total protein we consume, 75% of the total protein we consume is coming from animal sources. You can guess what that means. It's really a huge, really a huge sort of uh, effect not just the protein, but the other things. So the average is that. The last thing here, recommend upper limit. In 2002, uh, in the wisdom of the committee, who had been doing this every five years, they didn't want just to have a minimum recommended intake or an IDA. They wanted, and it was, it was a smart idea, I think. Let's put an upper limit. What's the upper safe limit? So they did this, upper safe limit. The upper safe limit for protein that was set in that document was 35%. 35%. Remember, I said 10% is enough. And we go beyond 10%, you see all kinds of things begin to happen. Lots of data on that. You ask yourself, where did that come from? I wasn't on that committee, but I had some friends on it, so I picked up a phone and called a couple of friends. I said, what are you doing? This is a, this is a news release. That, by the way, the news release is what wins the day. It's not for the committee report for the most part. So the news release went out and everybody heard about it. So I said, why are you saying 35% pro? Do you know that's not true? And so the first guy I called, his name is Joe, really was Joe. I won't give the last name, but he's an old friend for some time. I started saying, well, I said that. He said, well, he started defending because he was, a sub he was the chair of the subcommittee of the committee that decided. So why'd you do that? Set that up there like that. And he felt a little defensive at first and started saying, well, you know, this and that. I would say, well, I can't do this, can't. We were arguing a bit and finally he said to me, he says, he says, we're friends, he says, Colin, you know I don't know anything about nutrition. Here on the dietary guidelines with somebody sitting, I know him well too, he's a great guy. He was the head of toxicology at FDA most of his career. Uh, but he doesn't really know nutrition, and it turns out he's kind of was a fill in at the end because somebody else was there who left before the committee study was over to join the board of directors of Nestle Corporation. So I know too. So the question became then, how did that, and I saw I get the report out, big 900 some page report, look at it. I wanted to look at the evidence that they had for justifying 35%. There is no evidence. They had a paragraph about that, about that size. And so what happened was that between the, the olden days, we, the mistakes we make between the cup and the lip, essentially, what happened was the news release, the news release fashioned by the board that was responsible for this, they wrote the news release after the committee had looked at what they did. It was in the news release that this came out. Now, this 35%, for example, among professional dietitians in the United States, if you ask them, and I've done that, and an audience about 300 of them, they are accepting this as gospel. 35% is the upper limit for protein. No, it's not. It's mischief making, because if you allow that level, that's a license to continue doing what we're doing now, and even more. I just sort of end up on that note because the challenge is difficult. It's so, such a pleasure to talk to people like you, representing professions, 
in the public. We, we all, want, that's what we're doing. We, we want to talk about it because, quite frankly, having been in this sort of institution of science and so forth, I'm really disappointed with not having very much progress going on at that level. We need to do that. The public needs to know that. The public needs to know, you know, why aren't you hearing us? Because this is so important, what we talked about here, in terms of the future of our planet. Environmental issues, cost of health care, to say nothing for just the violence that's created against sentient beings, if you will. So, well, I mean, it's all nine yards. It's a big, big story. We just, at the bottom line, we have to understand what nutrition is, what it can do, and then defend it, and just simply say the science is there, folks. End of story. Thank you. In the new book I'm now writing, I've documented some of this, places, names, and, and so forth, and the meaning of this kind of stuff for the last 50 years. Um, because what it tells us, I, I'm not complaining, but it, what I have experienced is actually is a symbolic of our system. And so I want to tell that story. But having said that, yeah, people have reminded me, I don't really like to say this that much, but I will, because I think being public about it is better. Uh, four times I've been approached by people who wanted to do, uh, provide 24-7 protection, including one of them who was a former uh, director of security, Pentagon of all places. Uh, so um, I, I don't pay attention to that really because I don't quite believe it, uh, so I'm just passing it off. I just say it publicly sometimes because if something happens, then people can guess, kind of keeps them at hand, arm's length. But you know, I, I can sort of, in a sense, understand their their hostility, I, I guess, um, because it's about money, it's about it's jobs, money. something I have a hard time even solving myself. Because if this were all adopted, then um, we're talking about a reduction of, you know, a change, a big change, big, big changes. And all the, all I can say is, just tell the public as we're doing, let them decide. The public should not be not denied this information. So at least they're the ones paying for this, the public is, for the most part. And all I, my point of view is just tell the public. <laughs> Let them decide. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm not concerned about myself, though. May I ask a second question? Sure. I was wondering what your opinion is on the emergence of the use of cannabinoids and other um, parts, uh, nu nutrients, I guess, if you will, from the cannabis plants, and how, if, if that's something even you've been thinking about, because I know that they're showing some response to tumors, and now that they're allowing it to become legal in a lot of areas, well, the, then do you see a future in that, uh, you know, being able to test the, the cannabis, cannabis from... Oh, cannabis. Um, I, I can't really offer an opinion on that. Uh, it's, it's a plant-based substance, so I, I think that in reality, my guess is we'll see some benefits here and there. Whether they are sustained while somebody continues to do the wrong thing, that's the real question. So you, we might see some benefit, that's my guess. Uh, and At and least now they're allowing it to be tested. Oh, yes, allowing it. Yes, As, I'm all for that. Which definitely. is the first step. Yeah. Hi, I'm not in the medical profession, but a, just a private citizen just trying to, to change my lifestyle. Um, but what would be one or two things that we could do as private citizens to help this cause? Good question. Actually, I can give you a specific answer on that one. My older son, who directed the film Plant Pure Nation, so they may have seen it, uh, then that was used to build a network of so-called pods, he calls them. Uh, they are wellness groups, some already formed, some new. And there's more than 500 and some pods right now in 43 countries. And what these units do is to do what they, maybe some of them are focused on the environment, some are focused on just personal health, some of them, whatever. And so you got 500 and some, uh, and it's growing rapidly, by the way. Uh, and and it, it, you can go on the internet, you can find a pod in your area if you wish to join up with uh, like-minded people. Uh, and they're, they're doing some very exciting things. And, and uh, 
just, I can't tell the details yet, uh, but there's something big maybe going to happen with that. So I think, uh, yeah, it, it, just for general, if those of you who want to participate in some way, uh, go to the internet, Plant Pure Nation. Uh, find out a pod in your area, P-O-D. He called them pods, like seeds, <laughs> you know, pods, that, that kind of thing. Uh, because they'll all be networks so they can talk to each other. Uh, I like the idea. And uh, it might deal with, you know, positioning or proposing things for the legislators to consider. And, and so it's a big network, growing network of people. There's 130,000 members of those pods right now. And uh, it's very exciting. So maybe we'll grow that into a movement nationally. I think it's already national now. But so go, go sign up for a pod. Uh, one right there, yeah. Thank you for your huge contribution to all of us. Um, I want to ask you, as somebody who's still struggling to get my animal protein below 5%, are there forms of animal protein that you consider more benign as we, as we pare down to that percent and then eliminate it entirely? The future of animal protein? Well, the, f the forms of animal protein, in other words, coal is cold uh, water, wild-caught fish better than eggs or cheese, for instance, you know, if you're going down to zero, but you're not there yet. Right. Uh, that's a, it's a rather comp complex question. There's many different ways of looking at that. Uh, my view is that just tell the public about this. And I, I, I'm not, I don't like to be dogmatic. I may appear to be <laughs> that way. But I don't like to be dogmatic to tell people what they should do and should not do. Right. I also don't get too excited about too much government regulation and stuff. Right. Uh, but in any case, here's the goal. I, I can defend it on the, on the basis of science. The evidence surely supports that. The closer we get to 100%, the better we're going to be. Oh. And I honor the step that everybody takes to get to that goal. Okay. So nobody's slighted. You know, everybody can appreciate what they've accomplished, but just realize more can be accomplished if they go the whole way. Yeah. And the reason I say that in part, not just to be undogmatic, but also uh, our bodies change. Right. After you do this really well for a month or two or three, the t our taste preferences begin to change. When you get to a point where you look back, you just sort of ask yourself, how did I ever eat that stuff? Right. Um, that's it's kind of a nice idea, and it's kind of practical. And the practical side of it is just, I almost boil it down to two minimal ideas. Don't eat food that has animal protein in it. Not just because of the animal protein effect, but also the effect it has on the rest of the diet. So don't eat food that has animal protein intake. The second thing is eat whole food. Eat the food as clear as, we all don't, we're not gonna do that. But at least m migrate toward eating whole foods. You can Thank chop it up and stuff, but anyhow. So Thank it's just those two ideas. Thank you so much. Yeah. Can you elaborate on diet and the immune system, specifically how nutrition is related to lupus and eczema? Sorry, that echo in there didn't please my ears the right way. Could you elaborate on diet and lupus, and then also eczema, lupus, oh. autoimmunity? Yeah, uh, the question was, can I elaborate on diet and lupus? Not really. I don't know enough about it. But I will tell you that I have seen, uh, there are some places in this country that uh, offer fasting, water-only fasting. One of the best is in, uh, what's it called? Uh, Santa Rosa, California, it's called True North. Uh, I've gotten to know those folks. I wasn't much of a believer in fasting, but I was there, I saw. Uh, and what that whole program is about, if people have problems like lupus, that's why I'm saying it, uh, they, they can go for 10, 20, 30, 40 days with no, no food, just water only. And remarkable things happen to our bodies. And then they come off that onto a plant-based diet. It's really, truly remarkable. And uh, I know of a couple of cases of lupus were just eliminated, as it has been for some people with cancer. It's very exciting. But I, I can't, I, I, you know, a lot of these things, they just sort of happen because the whole food plant-based diet seems to operate by just a plethora of tsunami of mechanisms, you know, I can think of things, but I, I think that's what it is. It, the plant-based diet is a fact of nature. That's what we're discovering. 
we have discovered a fact of nature. And so we return to what nature can do. We use the food that nature provided for us, and we get well. But by some, what appears to be miraculous ways. That's all I can say. If, so for lupus people, do this and see what happens. That's what I can say. Is there a path that you can recommend for someone who's not currently in the medical field for nutrition? What? A, a path, a good... A path? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've been asked that often, especially by high school students, mm -hmm. uh, college students, those beyond college, what can we do? How can people get into this field? Uh, my answer is, some people would think maybe you could go to some university someplace and involved, get involved in a program. There are none. Mm -hmm. There are none in this country. Um, there's lots of people starting to talk about it, but not really being promoted by any kind of institution. Right. So the best way to do it, and I, I think it's just fine, if one wants to go to graduate work and get in that way in some kind of professional work, medical school or graduate work, just like go, I mean, you don't need to be too concerned about this. What the key is there, just learning some of the terminology and language and getting the credentials and publishing and so forth, learn the game, right. you know, how to be a professional. And then uh, that will obviously stay in your mind. And when you get out, then there'll be opportunities, I'm sure, because it's growing so fast. Of course. Thank you. Could you tell me if there have been any, any initiatives uh, to work with uh, health insurance companies to maybe pro provide incentives or rebates for people who are, say, certified whole food uh, uh, plant-based people, uh, much the way they've done with people who quit smoking? It's a good question. about. Uh, possibly working with health insurance companies and mm -hmm. getting them engaged in this. I, mm -hmm. I have been involved a little bit in some of those kinds of discussions and had met with a couple of really pretty high-ranking people on, on that side. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned something that was a little bit disturbing, especially in this case with United Health, which is one of the biggest, mm -hmm. with one of their leaders, and who was very impressed personally, but when they considered how they get involved, mm -hmm. they turned down mm -hmm. talking about uh, something like this. It was explained to me by somebody really experienced in lobbying mm -hmm. who told me I was being a little bit naive mm -hmm. because the health insurance companies are, are now operating in a big pond. Mm -hmm. They're all benefiting. And even if one did this, uh, you know, let's say a big one, mm -hmm. it would tend to, if it really worked and started promoting it, then the big pond sort of begins to dry up. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's true or not, but mm -hmm. there, there's this factor that the field is so lucrative now I say, so huge, uh, that uh, somehow somebody coming along like this here, small, they might gain some foothold. Uh, Dean Orange did some of this. Mm -hmm. He did this and he got, I think it was Omaha, uh, got on board a bit. Mm -hmm. it took him 16 years yeah. you know, to, to get that underway and I'm not sure it's gone very far. Mm -hmm. I think the issue is first to inform the consumers. They're the buyers, they're the, pay, they're the customers. And, and they will start buying, doing what they need to do. That'll force change. I think coming to try to force change from the top down, whether it's in the corporate world mm -hmm. or in the political world, it's difficult. All right. It's really difficult, banging your head against the wall a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the issue is just try to get the people informed. Now, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, as, long, as long as I've been around, I, I feel like I'm history almost itself. Um, I've seen the changes that have occurred, and I have to tell you, the changes that have occurred in the last 10, 15, 20 years are pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. And it's going. It is really starting to go fast. Yeah. And very exciting. Yeah. And I think that's where the changes are going to occur. Mm -hmm. let, the, let the insurance companies figure out what they should do. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of, to be honest about it, I'm kind of one-payer kind of person. Mm -hmm. uh, I know all the complaints of the one-payer system, but I lecture a lot in Europe, where the countries there are using one single payer system, mm -hmm. the government, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have better records than we do. And they pay a lot less money mm -hmm. for better care. And there's really good records on that. So I, I think that might work, something like that, where there's some unified. Well, here's, here's what I'm reacting to, I guess. Having been involved with government as, as I have, mm -hmm. people in government in crucial positions actually don't just sit 
sit by and ignore it and not adopt it, many of them, as part of institutions, they push back. Mm -hmm. In other words, they actually get actively involved in discrediting some of the stuff that I say mm -hmm. because they're actually looking out for their own, their own compatriots. Well, I guess they have some lobbyists from the other yeah, right. point of it's view lobby. as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, a, it's a big problem. And I, 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 so, and I, I, no, I offer no particular solution except mm -hmm. just tell as many people as possible, as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, change always starts slowly, but then it, things, it sounds like there's just beginning to be a little bit more momentum. Uh, maybe this will snowball a little bit and things will start moving faster. Maybe you talk with the Surgeon General, see what he says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Dr. Campbell. Um, I just wanted to share your frustration and the lack of nutrition education for physicians, um, but also to get your per per perspective on um, the lack of coordination even within the interdisciplinary healthcare team. Uh, I'm looking for your perspective on how we can bridge the gap between physicians who are not as educated in nutrition as they should be and dietitians who are extremely educated in nutrition and are the nutrition experts but are consistently underutilized within the healthcare team. Yeah, so the question is how could we get physicians uh, and dietitians uh, sort of informed in, in a sense? Maybe and to work together more often. I feel like usually physicians are a little bit less um, willing to utilize dietitians as the nutrition experts. Yeah, you know, you're speaking of an issue I've been aware of for decades almost, that in clinical settings, doctors, for example, they have the kind of final say on how care is administered. Um, and so they haven't given kind of respect to the dietitians they, they should, just on the basic principle. Uh, but unfortunately, the doctor is not trained in this area, and unfortunately, the dietitians aren't either. I mean, the dietitians and nutrition, I know that group quite well. I've, I should to their conferences and things. Very good people. They really are trying to do their best they can. Uh, but uh, there's that, so there's two things going on here. First, the hierarchy problem. Uh, and so both need to be sort of educated. And uh, I, I, think, I think the dietitians are going to come on board first. And I had a chance to speak to a state convention. I spoke to the National Convention a few times before, but uh, got a good reception because they know the problem. They're tired of being pushed around, you know, and they're tired of trying to struggle to get licensing or trying to struggle to get the right to do what they want to do. It's an issue, and I think that's what you're referring to. And uh, that's, yeah, it's an issue. What else can we say? And I, I just, I, I will do what I can to get the clinical dietitians especially, get them informed and let them start shouting. But I, I think your system is beginning to open up. I've given talks to a number of uh, medical conferences and, you know, almost totally 100% physician. I've spoken to about 150 medical schools at least. And, um, I, you know, they're, they're all good people. That's the way I look at them. They just didn't get the information. And I'm seeing change. Very gratifying. And I see the same thing in the uh, dietitian community too. It's going to happen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, and, and so you raised a good point, by the way. The pods is a fairly new concept. And there are quite a lot of pods really right now kind of idling, not really having an opportunity to, to get around some specific idea. Some are doing some really good things, very active. Some are not. It needs more leadership. Uh, and we're trying to provide that. That always requires money. <laughs> to some, to maintain a central staff. Um, I'm not in charge of that program, although our program has provided some funding. So anyone who might want to contribute as a nonprofit, contribute to that effort, it would really help. So it's like everything else, to get things going, need some of that kind of thing. When I did, though, refer before to something exciting happening, I don't want to say it now because it's not quite there, but if that happens, uh, that's all I can say it will be known nationwide. I really think it will be known nationwide. Uh, because I think it's, it, when I think about informing the public, and I've thought a lot, a lot about that, as my colleagues have, making information available is one thing, obviously, but it's something, it'd be nice to have some structure, you know, have public participation in this. 
And I think that podcast concept is good because individual pods can communicate with each other. If someone does something special, it'll be right there, a little video, to, okay, then others can do it. I think it's a kind of thing that'll go organically. Right now it's a little bit slow, but you know, it's only been going for like a year. That's part of the problem. So go back to one of those pods and say, you know, all of you got books. No. Okay, let's do it that way. <laughs>